afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the inaugural David Olive Distinguished Lecture. Uh, this is the first in what we intend to be an annual series of lectures held in memory of uh, our former colleague David Olive and uh, given by some of the world-leading figures in mathematical physics. David was one of the most influential mathematical physicists of his generation and contributed significantly to the development of string theory. He was educated in Edinburgh and his career encompassed positions at Cambridge, CERN and Imperial College. Then in 1992, uh, together with Professor Ian Halliday, he came to Swansea to establish the theoretical particle physics group. These lectures have been made possible by the generous sponsorship of the Learned Society of Wales, of which David was a founding fellow. And we are delighted that many of David's family, friends, and colleagues are with us uh, in the audience tonight. We're especially honored that our speaker for the inaugural lecture is Professor Robert Digraff, the director of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Professor Digraff has enjoyed an illustrious research career, and I'm sure he would share David's belief in the fundamental importance of elegant mathematics as the key to theoretical physics. I hope so, anyway. <laughs> uh, before I ask uh, Professor Kumar to introduce today's lecture, we thought that since this was the first in the, the series, it would be appropriate to start by inviting Ian Halliday to say a few personal words about David. Uh, Ian was a, a long-standing friend and colleague of David's. Uh, at Imperial, he was one of the first to recognize and promote the importance of high-performance computing and lattice field theory in particle physics. After moving with David to Swansea, he was head of department in physics until 1998, when he became chief executive of the Particle Physics and Astronomy Research Council. Subsequently, he was chief executive of the Scottish University's Physics Alliance and president of the European Science Foundation. He has held numerous key roles in international research administration uh, including while CEO of uh, PPARC, taking the UK into the European Southern Observatory. So it's my great pleasure to ask Ian to come and start our proceedings. Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be back in Swansea and it's an honor to give a few remarks about David. Uh, David and I have known each other, or had known each other for a long time. I'm just gonna pick three snippets out of David's past where we and he intersected. So first of all, we were undergraduates together at Edinburgh. And I want to give you a flavor of what education of physicists, theoretical physicists, mathematics, mathematicians was like in Edinburgh in those days. And the effect that perhaps had on where David's research career went. The theme of my talk is your past will surely catch up with you somewhere. So look after your fellow students, look after your lecturers. The past is always present. And I'll pick a couple of examples. So in those days in Edinburgh, Mathematics and theoretical physics and physics were separate entities. And if you were a student of one or other, you were more or less forced to take the others. So if you were a theoretical physicist to be, you weren't taught service mathematics, you were taught the same mathematics as the pure mathematicians were taught. No escape. Whether that's had an effect on me, David, it's hard to tell. But it's very different from the modern approach, either here or at Imperial or in most places in the UK. The professors in those days, there weren't so many professors, there was typically one per department. So 
So the head of mathematics was a very interesting guy. He was a New Zealander who had been basically traumatized in the First World War. He was into matrices, numerical calculations, whatever. But the sub-theme of my few remarks will be, I hate to mention it, Brexit. A New Zealander, traumatized in the First World War, ends up as a professor in Edinburgh. The professor in theoretical physics was a guy called Nick Kemmer, who'd been a student of Pauli's in Zurich, Pauli of uh, all sorts of things in theoretical physics, so Germanic influence. His father had been chemistry professor in Leningrad. So a message, the globe came to Edinburgh and we all benefited. We also had a system in Edinburgh which was quite odd when I think about it, which was that the older students and the, and the PhD students taught the younger students in problem sessions. So I, as a first year student, and I was basically two years behind David, was taught by Tom Kibble of Higgs Kibble fame. Right? It became very clear to most of us bright young first year students that the research students were typically a lot cleverer than the lecturers. <laughs> if you wanted to know the answer to a question in that session, you didn't ask the lecturer, you asked Tom Kibble, okay? There's messages there about age, youth, experience, etc. That also meant you got to know the people above you, the rising stars of one year above, two years above, three years above. And that time in Edinburgh, it was really quite a galaxy. It was Tom Kibble at the top. Below him, there was a renegade, a guy called Jim Merlees, who did well in mathematics, but he went off and won a Nobel Prize in economics. I don't think that's an accident. We were taught in a system where, you know, mathematics was a tool, you apply it to theoretical physics, you apply it to whatever comes to hand. David, Ian Drummond, same year, myself, a bit later, somewhere down the line, Graham Shore, there was a tradition. And of course, overshadowing us all and setting a style was Mr. Clark Maxwell, who of course was a product of Edinburgh, went from Edinburgh to Cambridge, set a standard that all our students tried to aim at. Not altogether successfully, but that was there in, in the air. Okay, remarks about David. David did spectacularly well. The mathematics department had a very strange procedure then, which it, it never told you how many questions you had to do an exam. It dropped a hint. Five questions would be enough. But you could do as many as you liked, right? David typically did, I believe, seven, eight, nine, with a big uncertainty, because the story, much repeated, was that the lecturers in mathematics came to David and said, OK, you got 150%, pretty good, but you'd have got about 250 if we'd been able to read the other 10 questions you had done. <laughs> so it plagued David for the rest of his life, but nobody could read his writing. And that started at an undergraduate level. OK, so what's, what's the little story here? The importance of keeping contact, whatever. At the very end, a new young lecturer appeared called Peter Higgs, who I don't think taught David, but taught me. I'll come back to Peter Higgs. This is the Higgs of the Higgs sparkle that you've probably all heard of. Little did I know when I met Peter Higgs. Okay, time passed. David went to the States, he went to Pittsburgh, came back, got a job in Princeton, ended up going to CERN on a, on a staff position at CERN, and we intersected there. That was very socially jolly because all of us, Ian, David, and Jenny, we all had young kids. And so there was a different kind of 
dynamic between the set of people at CERN. Since we were all at CERN, we were obviously all bright people with a future and so on. But I have a clear memory of, of David. David at that point was working on the so-called uh, olive Montonin duality, which is a statement about magnetic monopoles. And we were staying in a big, apart a big set of apartments called Le Lignon. So David was always quite fond of looking after his, his purse, shall we say. Not just his personal purse, but department purses, other things. He was, he was the archetypal Scotsman in that, in, that, in that. So in some weird way, I ended up running the taxi service with my car between Le Lignon and CERN every morning. Okay, back and forward, back and forward. Always my car, always my car for some reason. Always my car, my car. But it was very educational because in the car, typically, were David and Jean Noitz, and they were endlessly talking about Olive Montonin duality. You may not be aware of it. If theoretical physicists get a bee in their bonnet, you cannot stop them. Day and night probably drives wives, well, I know it drives wives crazy, but just on, on, on. So this was one of the formative ideas that played out over the rest of David's career. I also have a, and Graham may enjoy this, one of the social highlights of being at CERN at that point, at that point was intense tennis matches. So all my life, I'd been in, in competition with a bunch of Italians led by a guy called Daniel Amati. Mysteriously, we ended up on opposite sides always of the tennis net, okay? On his side was Gabriel Veneziano, the inventor, as we may hear, of string theory and string models. And then my secret weapon was my student, research student, then, Chris Sagrada, who was by far the best of the tennis players. So this was a very interesting piece of dynamics in the sense that there were stylists like Amati and Veneziano, and there were people with long arms like me, and then there were good tennis players like Chris. Right? And how that played out all the time was pretty good. So a good time was had by all. Okay, I went back to Imperial. David eventually left CERN, came to Imperial. We spent a long time at Imperial doing our thing various ways. And then uh, there was a, an odd event happened. There was a conference in Swansea where two of the highest ranked people in current mathematics and theoretical physics was Michael Atia, who has just died, unfortunately, and Ed Witten from, from the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, had a meeting where they agreed that this idea in Edinburgh, that it was physics over here and mathematics over here, actually was false. And there was a very, very interesting meeting, which unfortunately I was not at, but Aubrey Truman sitting over there, the then head of the department, was at it. And Aubrey was looking for an idea as to how to improve the maths department in Swansea. And he picked this idea up and hunted around for the appropriate person who might be able to carry this forward and alighted on David. Now, this is university politics, so nothing is ever quite as simple so I think Aubrey was going to the Vice-Chancellor, was arguing. The Vice-Chancellor thought, well, it's good that mathematics is improving, but I've got a problem in physics. Um, go away, David, and think about this problem. So David ended up coming into my office looking slightly sheepish and embarrassed and said, do you fancy coming to Swansea? Uh, you know, I spent 25 years at Imperial and yeah, yeah, yeah. didn't, didn't le leap to my... Anyway, right, I would agree that I would come and talk to the Vice-Chancellor. I don't know whether Brian Clarkson's anywhere around. If so, put your hand up, Brian. No, no, no. Actually, we did a deal. 
right? So, um, that we would come. Um, I would come to physics, David would go into mathematics, let me not go into all the ins and outs and whatever. I think it worked. I don't know whether Tony Davis is here. He, hi Tony, was very welcoming into physics. We worked pretty hard getting physics into teaching rankings and all the rest of it. Go back to Imperial and say, well, you know, I don't really want to go, really, really. Um, what's your counter offer? There basically was no counter offer. We, d we don't believe you will go. What was their counter offer? <laughs> you know, a bit like Brexit and all that. You know, are you in, are you out? <laughs> I remember a meeting with Eric Ash, who at that point was the vice chancellor of, at Imperial. And he basically said, you won't go. It will be a, and I choose my words carefully, I think he said, a terminal appointment. I wasn't quite sure what that meant, but anyways. Anyway, Dave and I came. We had great fun appointing the young guys who are not so young as they once were, who are scattered around the audience, who I think have done extremely well for Swansea, for theoretical physics, whatever. I take my hat off to Aubrey's ideas to make this all happen. It's a pity it didn't quite go down the straight and narrow path, but that's another story for another day. But I think the message again is people with ideas can make things happen and that is important. I mentioned that it's unpredictable. Talking about this terminal appointment. I ended up post my terminal appointment on CERN Council for seven years. This is where it gets a bit sick. What did I spend most of that seven years fighting for? It was for the British Treasury to put large amounts of money into CERN in order that we could find the particle that this little first year lecturer who had taught me stuff back in Edinburgh all these years called Peter Higgs. So if you told me in 1959 that this lecturer was going to cause me five years at least of angst <coughs> and cost the British taxpayer several billion euros, I wouldn't have believed you. I just would not have believed you. Um, so I think I've given you some kind of idea of David as an undergraduate, spectacular output. David as an influential guy at CERN with lots of influences and so on, I mean, both in the ideas and so on. Later, David and Aubrey plotting to make this happen. Now, David didn't like the detail, but he had the vision to see that it could, it could be made to work. And I believe we got something really quite valuable in Swansea. So I've probably talked far too long, but I hope I've given you some kind of feeling for David as visionary in theoretical physics and also visionary in the kind of thing that could be made to happen at a political kind of university department level. Okay, I'll stop. Thank you. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Robert Digraff and formally introduce him to you. Uh, for those of us who are in the field of theoretical physics, high energy physics, uh, Roberts is a very familiar name and figure. He's renowned for his important contributions to the development of string theory and quantum field theory, and for helping forge new links between physics on the one hand and geometry and mathematics on the other. Uh, he has made seminal contributions to a number of areas in theoretical physics. Uh, I'm just going to reel off a bunch of topics. Two-dimensional quantum gravity, conformal quantum field theories, quantum aspects of black holes, non-perturbative formulation of string theory, and in general for unraveling 
the complex web of connections between topological string theory, quantum field theory, and matrix models. Uh, Robert obtained his PhD in 1984 at Utrecht under uh, Gerard Toft, uh, who to all particle physicists is a famous hero, and he's also a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, Robert subsequently held positions at Princeton University, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, and the University of Amsterdam. Since 2012, Robert has been the director of the prestigious Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. This is famously the intellectual home of Albert Einstein and has been associated with several Nobel laureates and Fields medalists. Robert has also been the president of the Royal Netherlands Ac Academy of Arts and Sciences and is the recipient of several awards and honors, including the Spinoza Prize, the Knight of the Order of the Netherlands Lion, and the Fellowship of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Uh, Robert is a very passionate and eloquent communicator of science to the general public, and he's a great champion of curiosity-driven research. He's also a fine artist, I think, and uh, I can say I experienced some of this long ago as a postdoc uh, when I was attending some of his lectures and saw beautifully hand-drawn slides which complemented equally beautiful mathematics and physics that he was presenting. I'm also aware that Robert is no stranger to Wales because he spoke at the Hay Festival, which is not so far away from here recently. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Professor Robert Digra for the inaugural David Olive Distinguished Lecture. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Prem, and, and, and thank you all for, for attending this, uh, this, this very special lecture. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, speak uh, also in the honor of uh, David, David Olive, who just was, I would say, an abs absolutely marvelous person, uh, very warm. But it actually, today, I think we should also recognize that, you know, although he isn't here, that you know, both his physics and mathematics is with us every day, and it grows more powerful and also how we believed in institutions. And I think what he and you, Professor Holliday, and others have done here in building in Swansea is something that I think is very special. I feel very much at home. You somehow are able to bring math and physics together in a way that is uh, not done at many other places. So I think that continues, and that's a wonderful thing. Also, if you think about kind of the topics that uh, David has been thinking, I will, I will actually do uh, some sense uh, a walk through the various topics that he thought about and, um, and where his legacy is being felt. But I think the big topic for me today is, you know, how physics and mathematics are intersecting and in some sense, you know, what's kind of being developing on their kind of, uh, where, where they meet. Now, that's a very long subject. You know, many famous physicists have spoken about this. Here you see Galileo. Galileo had this wonderful phrase, the book of nature. So you read as a, as a physicist, as a scientist, you read the book of nature. In order to read it, you should be able to understand the language in which it was written. And this is the 17th century. So math is Euclidean geometry. You thought about triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures. And as he said here, if you do not understand the language, you are forever wandering around a dark labyrinth. Um, but this view of the importance of mathematics and physics continues. Like uh, in the more recent days, Richard Feynman, uh, by the way, not known as a great sophisticated lover of mathematics, he still, he said, for those who do not know mathematics, it's difficult to get across the real feeling as to the beauty, the deepest beauty of nature. If you want to understand that beauty, you have to know the language that she speaks. Now, on the other hand, Feynman is also known by the quote, if mathematics disappeared today, physics would be set back exactly one week. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I always felt very difficult what would be the right answer. Uh, and you just mentioned uh, Sir Michael Atia, uh, who's dearly missed, uh, had a tremendous, so he had the perfect repost to that. He said, that was the week that God created the world. <laughs> <laughs> so I say 2-1, math to physics. Uh, um, but, you know, there is this kind of tension. So uh, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton has a motto, and the motto is truth and beauty. 
And before the first professors, the founding director picked that motto, uh, of course, borrowing from Keats. And there's this question of you know, what's more important, truth or beauty? And uh, Hermann Weil, the famous mathematician who was one of also one of the few first professors, you get a very diplomatic answer. You know? I try to combine the true with the beautiful, but when I had to choose one or the other, I usually chose the beautiful. That's actually very honest. You know? Just the mathematical beauty. Uh, Paul Dirac actually went even further, saying that you know, it's more important for equations to be beautiful than to fit experiments. <laughs> Um, there is the other perspective. Actually, uh, something I want to come back later in the lecture is this nice quote by John Wheeler. John Wheeler, among others, the, uh, you know, he worked on, um, on, on nuclear physics with Bohr. Uh, he named black holes. Uh, and he has this wonderful saying, every law of physics pushed to the extreme will be found to be statistical and approximate, not mathematically perfect and precise. Actually, quite a deep statement because you want the beauty, the mathematical beauty, to survive, to be sustainable. And there will always be new facts, new experiments. So his view that in some sense perhaps the beauty that we are looking for is statistical, I want to come back. I also want to quote Francis Crick from Crick and Watson fame. Any theory that can account for all the facts is wrong, because some of the facts are always wrong. <laughs> uh, and I think there's, uh, there's lots of uh, evidence for that. Um, but still you can ask, you know, if our purpose in the end is to combine the beauty of mathematics with the truth of physics, what kind of beauty are we looking for? And there are basically two points of view where you can find useful mathematics in the universe. One end actually is at the very small. So you can say, you know, if you look at the everyday world, say the world of light and matter, it's ex extremely complicated. But you can say, well, in the end we can all reduce it to elementary particles. And if you reduce it enough, you get very simple laws. So from that point of view, the mathematical elegance is found at the very bottom, the smaller structures, out of which you build the rest of the universe. Well, this has obviously been an extremely successful path in science. But there's an opposite view. Say, for instance, if you take a glass of water, you know, it consists of you know, billions and billions of water molecules, their behavior is extremely complicated. It's very, very messy. But out of it come simple laws, the laws of hydrodynamics, the laws of thermodynamics. So from that point of view, the mathematical beauty is at a very large. Uh, it's emergent out of the random behavior of many, many particles. So you can even in mathematics can that to, that take that two points of view. Or in physics, so I will talk about the two great theories of currently in theoretical physics. We have a theory at the very large, relativity theory, the curvature of space and time. We have a theory for the very small, quantum mechanics. Uh, they're very different in nature. In some sense, the corresponding mathematics is very different. Relativity is about the geometry of space-time, so it's very visually uh, amenable. Quantum mechanics is, ver is very algebraic. It's very abstract. It's very hard to imagine anything if you talk about quantum mechanics. And again, there are kind of two arrows that I want to discuss. There's an arrow that kind of takes objects from geometry and brings it into mathematics. So the orbits of particles go into quantum amplitudes. That's in some sense, again, the, the, the reductionist point of view. And then at the end, I want to say something about the opposite. Is it also possible that somehow <laughs> geometry emerges out of quantum mechanics? And I want to say yes, and this actually is, uh, is a very deep fact. And in, in some sense, I think the tension I'm setting up here will resolve, because in the end, what we're all looking for is obviously a theory that combines these two ingredients. The kind of holy grail theoretical physics, called the quantum gravity or quantum geometry, uh, is to combine both the world of the large and the small into one. And what could that possibly be? Well. I want to kind of start from the very beginning. So uh, think about, in some sense, the history of these concepts are is that geometry is getting more and more flexible. It becomes richer, and in the end, it kind of almost disappears. Now, the classical view of geometry is that it's infinite, it's flat, it's Euclidean, it's very rigid. Uh, it's like the perfect stage on which physical phenomena can happen. And uh, time, similarly, is something very rigid and absolute. Newtonian time, 
was basically a big clock that ticks and the movement of all particles is being synchronized by this kind of great conductor. Now, you all know that uh, this change with uh, Albert Einstein's view of space-time, so bringing space and time together. And, uh, and so, famous statement, time is the fourth dimension. So, you know, uh, in, in, in modern physics, you know, often we use uh, objects of more than two or three dimensions, and certainly some of the younger students might wonder, you know, how, how do you imagine this? So, so, a little bit of a, an aside, and clearly we all understand two dimensions, so here you see, uh, by the way, all my PowerPoints are homemade, so here you see a three-dimensional object, uh, but actually you're not watching anything three-dimensional, of course, you're just watching the screen. But you know, even if I would have taken the trouble to transport a whole cube here to Swansea, now, you would still look at your retina in your eye, right? So nobody of us have ever seen a three-dimensional object. It's your mind that just imagines the third dimension. So I had a colleague uh, at NYU, actually, who for a full year tried to do something similar with four-dimensional objects. So this is a four-dimensional cube projected into three dimensions. So he, for a full year, manipulated his images and hoped that his brain would say click and he would see the fourth dimension. <laughs> The only thing I can say, one year is not long enough, so I'm always looking for volunteers. <laughs> uh, but um, it's very difficult to see this. Uh, I, I knew one uh, mathematician, uh, Bill Thurston, uh, who was a long-time mathematician in, in Prince, who really could move in these higher dimensions. And once he gave a lecture showing how things were turned inside out in four dimensions, and he was giving this lecture, and at some point he looked in the audience, and he see all these blank stares. Like, nobody, nobody was following him. And then he looked and he paused and he said, oh, of course, uh, I shouldn't do this in four dimensions. Uh, you should move to five dimensions. <laughs> um, so, but the way to think about these higher dimensional spaces, so just to make that illustration, is to think of time really as a, as a dimension, is to think of like a movie. This is a small movie. If you think of this movie as a sequence of images, and you put these images on top of each other, as in this little animation, you see that you know, time is moving upwards, and uh, to, if you think of a single particle that was like in this image, was the two particles were rotating around each other, now you get these kind of spaghetti strands here, these world lines, as we call them, moving up in space and time. And so Einstein's big view was that actually you should look at the complete picture on the right-hand side, space and time, and particles become these kind of trajectories. Now, that's a very interesting thought, and I want to uh, connect it to perhaps a question that some of you might have never asked yourself. You know, but if you learn about physics, you learn about the properties of particles. But why are, have the properties, particles this magical property that they're all exactly the same? Like you learn about the mass of the electron. There's never an electron that has a little scratch on it, it's, or, it's, or it's slightly larger or slightly smaller. They exactly have the same mass, the same charge. Why are particles identical? Now, uh, this question was uh, raised by, again, John Wheeler um, when he was at some point ca called in the middle of the night in, on a Saturday, his then graduate student Richard Feynman. And Feynman describes this anecdote in his Nobel Prize lecture. And Wheeler asked him, Feynman, why do electrons all have the same energy or the same charge and mass? And then Wheeler blurred, because there's only one electron in the whole universe. And let me explain this idea, because actually it's quite interesting, and we will push it further. So here's the uh, electron, and now uh, usually it would go up in time, like as we all are going up in time. But suppose that I want to make an identical copy of myself. Now one way to do this is to use a time machine. If I would have a time machine, I would go in and come back and walk here on the stage and stand next to myself, and I can do it again and again. So if you would have a time machine, it's very easy to make an exact copy of yourself. So this was Wheeler's image. Suppose your electrons are allowed to go back in time, and up in time, and back again. They can weave a big knot, go up and down, and up and down, and up and down. And if you look at this as a trajectory in space-time, that as a sequence of images, you know, on the bottom one, you would have just one electron. But if you, in the middle, you would cut this knot in many different points, and you see lots of electrons, actually electrons and anti-electrons and positrons, which are electrons going downward in time. 
And so you get this whole cloud of particles and antiparticles. And of course they are the same because it's the same particle just, you know, going up and down in time. Well, apparently Feynman immediately answers, well, if this case it should be equal number of particles and antiparticles, but the idea actually is, I would say, essentially correct. This is the way in which particles behave, and that's why a quantum particle uh, is very different from a classical particle. Now, Feynman forgot about this idea, but then a few years later, he actually starts, and I find this very touching, this is the first page in his notebooks, when he starts doing these calculations, he, he's gently pushing these particles back in time and finding that actually the, the scheme works. Actually, this is a way to calculate. And of course, this was then led to the famous Feynman diagrams. Uh, now, Feynman diagrams are these, these images where you know, particles go up and they, they can have particles going, shooting, so to say, from one particle. This is the modern image how two particles exchange a force by exchanging this kind of so-called virtual particles, particles that you uh, use in your calculation, but actually cannot physically measure. And then this is wonderful uh, anecdote that Feynman describes, that he's making these drawings and wonders, now how would the world look like, how would physics would look like if we would all make drawings instead of calculations? Of course, uh, that's now the case. You know, you see Feynman diagrams everywhere. Uh, this is a wonderful anecdote I want to share with you, is that in the 1960s, there was a graduate student walking in Los Angeles, and he saw this van driving, which you know, had Feynman diagrams on, on it. And he's, uh, a woman is driving the van, and he stops her at the traffic light. And he says, uh, Mrs., I, I just have to tell you, you know, the, the diagrams on your van, you know, the, we use them all the time in physics. We call them Feynman diagrams. And she says, yes, I know, I'm Mrs. Feynman. <laughs> uh, and here's Feynman with his uh, van. Actually, uh, last year I had the centenary of uh, Feynman, and uh, I had my selfie with the van. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, one thing that you can, you can push this for very much, and that's you know, the language of quantum field theory, is that particles can do uh, much more crazy things. They, they kind, of, kind of split up in two and merge again. That's kind of all allowed. Uh, I often joke that, you know, uh, the rules of quantum mechanics are very natural if you, I'm Dutch, you know, in the Netherlands, because basically it says, you know, if you do it fast enough before it's being detected, it's okay. <laughs> which is somehow our, how Dutch society works. Uh, and uh, you can even have the extreme case, which is the case that, in some sense, you know, Wheeler uh, was thinking of. You know, this is a, a process where a particle and an antiparticle are created out of nothing, and they kind of disappear again. Or, if you wish, a particle that goes up and down in time. So this is something that is allowed in quantum field theory, in quantum mechanics. And uh, this is a vacuum process, of particles that uh, disappear and appear out of nothing. In fact, uh, if you want, uh, you should kind of think of the, uh, this is my own kind of attempt of to make an animation that how I imagine the vacuum. So empty space is this boiling pot where continuously particles appear and disappear. It's something you can physically measure. It's called the Casimir effect. You can measure it in laboratories. And uh, this is wonderful saying by the physicist uh, Gell Mann that in quantum theory, everything that's allowed is obligatory. So quantum mechanics kind of probes all these different things. And you know, that's actually a very rich framework for mathematics too. I mean, one of the, and I won't have time to say much about this, but one of the great themes of mathematics is that you know, quantum theory, which is so unnatural, is kind of ideal for mathematical purposes. In a, in a qu the quantum mechanical world, basically everything happens, and you have to consider all possible processes. So you have to make kind of a dictionary or an encyclopedia of all possible phenomena. And this is exactly what mathematicians want to study, because they usually study all members in a certain family. So the quantum framework is very natural for modern mathematics. Now, I would say it's, you know, it's, it's quite a surprise that mathematics is still working at the level of particle theories. So if you go to the 1960s, for a brief moment, uh, I would say theoretical physics had almost given up in finding a mathematical underpinning of the simplest processes. So at that time, we had basically a black box view of particle physics. And there's something coming in, something going out, and there's no way in which the box can be opened. 
Uh, this is famous uh, quote by Freeman Dyson, my colleague at the Institute, who uh, gave the Gibbs lecture in 1972 and said, I'm acutely aware of the fact that the marriage between mathematics and physics, which was so fruitful in past centuries, recently ended in divorce. Uh, so I think these are kind of uh, famous last words. Because right at that time, in the early 70s, there was this whole new generation of physicists and mathematicians, and David is an example par excellence of that generation, that you know, started to, I would say, fall in love again. And, uh, and I'm joking that not only can the box be opened, but inside the box is this teeny tiny formula. So uh, if you want, with a lot of explanations, you can fit the standard model of particle physics on one line. Uh, there's a lot of hidden symbols here. But now I could give a lecture to mathematicians about particle physics and all the objects would be entirely natural geometrical mathematical objects, which is, I think, extremely remarkable that nature has picked that language which is so natural. Now, actually, this is not the way you learn the standard model of particle physics in a typical physics course. Uh, you get more something like this which uh, is uh, from a course by uh, my thesis, thesis advisor, uh, Tini Veldman, who really wants to emphasize you know, how many different terms there were in the Lagrangian. But I also like to say that it fits on the standard model. A uh, standard model fits on a t-shirt. Now that's quite remarkable, that we are able to capture the whole physical world as we see around it, in terms of uh, now with the Higgs particle added, with uh, 17 particles. Now, if you say, what is that underlying pattern that makes everything work? I would say it's, it's geometry and it's symmetry. Symmetry is the key ingredient. And that's somehow an idea going back again to Hermann Weyl. So let me illustrate this, for instance, with uh, an example of the strong force, you know, where we have quarks. Quarks have three different colors. And I'm just using here uh, images to get you a certain feel for that without using too many equations. So you can think of a quark as a little arrow in a three-dimensional space. And the direction of the arrow actually gives it its value of its so-called quote-unquote color. So, uh, in fact, it's a quantum field, so the arrow is not at, at one point, but actually in every point of space and time. So it's more like this. I like to say this is the communist model, where they all uh, are moving in shrink. In fact, the symmetry in physics is much larger, because you can have each arrow can move separately which is the much more liberal uh, Western model, I would say, where like, all these arrows go separately. So there's a huge symmetry group in these, in these theories, which we call a local gauge symmetry. And in some way, it's the arrows of the waves in these arrows that you know, are the quantum fields. They propagate. Uh, that's a classical image. Uh, a quantum image would, again, be using these uh, Feynman diagrams. And you can think of gauge fields as something, uh, a sort of intermediate, field that allows quarks to change color. So if you have three colors, they're roughly three by three, there's a three by three matrix of uh, gluons of gauge fields that connect the different kind of, uh, of quarks. Now, I think that's kind of my summary for the moment for the theory of the very small. Uh, somehow culminating in the concept of a gauge symmetry, a quantum gauge symmetry. Let's now move to the very large to the theory of gravity. So, of course, there, again, Einstein's uh, equations are famous. Uh, I learned today that the equal sign was a Welsh invention. I think that's uh, very good to know, because I, I I'm really have a, I'm, I'm a cause to kind of give more attention to the equal sign, because I think it's the most important part in any equation. This is Einstein's equation for general relativity. Now, in a cartoon version, it says roughly, just like E equals MC squared, it says energy equals mass. It says that space equals mass. And again, the equal sign is inc incredibly important because it's connecting two different worlds that a priori would not be connected. I mean, that's the great strength of mathematical equations, that it connects objects that often belong to completely different domains. And I always find it very nicely with the equal sign, it has these two vertical lines. That some, it's almost like an electric current can flow in both directions. Ideas go from one to the other and, and back. So without using the sophisticated mathematics, what general relativity is doing is basically doing two things. First, if mass tells space how to curve. That's one way to see it. So space-time reacts to the distribution 
of matter. Uh, space is no longer the rigid Euclidean object that we thought for a long time. It becomes flexible. You can almost think of it as space made out of rubber that reacts to the distribution of energy. And then secondly, that curved space tells mass how to move. And that means that orbits are um, of interesting geometrical shapes. And of course, this is wonderful. Uh, Einstein was very lucky uh, that uh, for his theory, the mathematics was already developed. Very different from quantum field theory, and in some sense the math had to be developed, it wasn't there yet. In, in Einstein's case, mathematicians in the 19th century had developed exactly the mathematical apparatus to describe curved space-times. Now, of course, uh, this was a tremendous discovery. I have to uh, remind you this this year, we're celebrating exactly 100 years. Uh, it was in, 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 in May 1919 when Eddington did the famous experiment uh, detecting the uh, deflection of light, of starlight by the sun, the, the experiment that made uh, Einstein famous. Uh, and by the way, here on the right-hand side is one uh, of the original images. Actually, it's in the Institute's archive uh, belonged to Einstein of seeing the, uh, the stellar light deflection. So Einstein must have looked at that picture and felt pretty good, I think. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, the, the rest is history. So in particular, of course, one of the consequences of Einstein's theory that he was the first person to actually you know, calculate, so to say, the fate of the universe. And you all know the results of that. He found that the universe expanded, um, which, you know, at already for Einstein was a really dramatic conclusion. Uh, a dramatic conclusion because if you have an expanding universe, you have a universe that in the past was smaller and smaller. So there should be a moment where it was created. Well, we now we think of this very naturally as the Big Bang. We endlessly have heard about that. But for Einstein, that was really uh, a very serious point. As he said, you know, you would have an effect uh, without a cause. Now, in physics, in some sense, it's all about uh, predicting what happens next. Our physical laws are made to predict the future, although even infinitesimally. But still, if we know the situation right now, we can calculate the future. Uh, if you would have a Big Bang, a singularity at the very beginning, this would be, uh, in some sense, very dramatic. Now, he famously changed his calculations. You know, he added... Uh, a constant, a cosmological constant, that uh, tried to kind of balance the universe and not make it expand anymore. Uh, after it was discovered that the universe did expand, he allegedly, I'm not sure anybody has the right quote for this, that this was his biggest blunder, uh, but uh, now this is known as dark energy, so we like to say that even Einstein's blunders were absolutely brilliant. Uh, actually, the, the real detection of the uh, expanded un expanding universe, the discovery of it goes to uh, Georges Lemaitre, uh, a Belgian cosmologist, uh, who was quite successful. You know, he was, you know, he, he, he was also uh, a, a Catholic priest, so he was the one who could both communicate to Einstein and the Pope. Uh, and he, had, uh, he, he wasn't successful in naming the the origin of the universe. He had, I think, two candidates, the primeval atom and the cosmic egg. And uh, both, I think, don't think, had a long, long history. Uh, and, of, of course, uh, Edwin Hubble, who uh, just came just after him. As you know, you know Einstein never actually lived to uh, f see the, the physical evidence for an expanding universe. But the cosmic microwave background was detected in 1965. And now we have these kind of beautiful images uh, that you all have seen, of basically the baby photos of the universe, these very small density fluctuations, roughly one part in 100,000, that uh, started the universe. Uh, and that's basically as far as we can look back in time. So modern cosmologists have these pictures where you see these, uh, the, the, the CMB uh, in the far ranges, and it always reminds me very much about these medieval cosmologists. You know, we have these concentrated circles. And now we have been able to reconstruct the, uh, the whole, the, this is 13.8 billion years of cosmic evolution compressed to 20 seconds. Now you see how the small fluctuations of the early universe condense. Matter is being created in the end, the galaxies, the stars, and the physical universe as we see it right now. So that's an absolutely amazing story. Um, it's, it's a great victory of Einstein's theory. 
uh, it has given us a tremendous insight in the, and built basically a standard model of cosmology. So we have now the wonderful thing that we have standard models for the very small, standard models for the very large. And so the question is what's there left to be done? What are the big issues and how do we think that they are addressed? Well, there are several things that you know, have to come into the picture. Uh, first of all, that um, these cosmological measurements very clearly indicate what we do not understand. So I think we are uh, now in a very wonderful position that we have a very good sense of what's kind of missing in our understanding of the universe. So there are two components to that. You've all heard about it. The first is dark matter. You know, if you think of galaxies, uh, they're actually surrounded by huge clouds of some substance, some form of matter. It's called dark matter. It would be bet better to call it translucent matter, transparent matter. It's something where light goes through. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the distribution of galaxies, then actually you, uh, they all are connected by this huge cosmic web of dark matter, uh, five times more than the, the visible matter. So that's a huge question what it is, new particles, what collection of particles. And the second ingredient is that we have discovered that the universe not only expands, but it expands much faster than, and, and, and accelerates actually, uh, given... Uh, uh, the, the standard theories. And so that led to the famous discovery of dark energy, which is a, this, this extra field pushing the universe apart. And our, our understanding is, well, our understanding, we, we think it's connected to this wonderful property of the vacuum, that empty space in just in gravity, in Einstein's theory, is a very boring object, can be curved, etc. But quantum field theory makes it come alive. Uh, empty space should be full of quantum particles that live for very brief times, and they should be able to produce some energy. Uh, the actual value of that uh, cosmological constant, or that, that kind of vacuum energy, is remarkably small in natural units. Uh, if in natural units, it's 10 to the minus 120. So it's in some sense the least understood number that we measured in physics. Uh, but we do feel that understanding the combination of quantum mechanics and gravity will shed light on this phenomena and this particular number. So if you look at the universe at this point, you know, we, uh, the stars, the galaxies, account for 5% and there is roughly 27% dark matter and the rest is dark energy. And this is, this is quite astonishing that you know, we have uh, this 95% of the universe missing. Often, I, if I talk to people in other fields of science, I ask them, what's your percentage of dark matter? You know, uh, say, life scientist or neuroscientist. I think actually 5% is pretty good. Uh, I, I think actually probably, probably physis physicists are in a better shape than many other scientists, I think. And the remarkable thing is, of course, that you know, two, 20 years ago, that 95% wasn't even there. Uh, we weren't even aware, we didn't know, we didn't know. Uh, this is a phrase that I think the, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, at some point used, so it's very <laughs> delicate. But uh, the unknown unknowns uh, have now become known unknowns, which is a great thing. But I think this is, so both the composition and the origin of the universe is a great mystery. Another great mystery, part of uh, modern physics, is black holes. Um, black holes are, for a long time, appeared in science fiction books and in the pages of theoretical physics volumes. But now they're everywhere, you know, you, uh, we see them in terms of collapsed uh, stars, they're in the center of galaxies, you know. Every galaxy up to now is, is, uh, has seemed to contain huge black holes that you know, are million to a billion solar masses. And very exciting, I think there's a process underway right now the Event Horizon Telescope, to make, literally take a picture of the black hole in the center of our Milky Way. And I think uh, some results are predicted in, in, in April. So I think we're all quite excited to see this. So I wouldn't be surprised in a month you will see actually a picture, an honest picture of the black hole on the front page of your news, news magazine. Who knows? Uh, very exciting. Now, black holes are also really fascinating from a theoretical point of view. So this is a space-time diagram of a black hole. Uh, so you have to read these pictures by time flowing upwards. This is a shell of matter imploding. So the, the purple 
part here below is a star, it creates a singularity, that's the green, green piece here. And then it has an horizon, the famous event horizon, which is a sphere, here it's of course a circle because I've uh, cut out uh, uh, an extra dimension, uh, a sphere that is somehow guarding the no-go zone around the black hole. If you enter this horizon, you're, you're basically damned, you, you have only, uh, you're forced to be flown into the singularity. And for those of you who haven't seen this before, it's quite striking how definite we are about this prediction that your fate is to be squashed once you enter the black hole. And that's because in all these pictures, time is flowing upwards. But if you follow actually the, the solution of the black hole in general relativity, then the moment you go inside the black hole, time flows inwards. So, you know, just as, you know, you know there's only, let's say, one meter that, you know, separates you from the center of the sphere, here it could be, say, one minute that separates you, and time is flowing here, and you know just that your life will come to an end the moment you step inside that horizon. Now, uh, it's literally the end of time. And I think that's perhaps the most striking, I think, of our present you know, understanding of the world at large. So we have this beautiful cosmology, but it has two problems with real, real um, confusion or paradox, which is the beginning of our cosmos, where we have a beginning of time. What do we mean even by that? And then inside black holes, we have the end of time. So in the theory of general relativity, we confronted with a real existential problem. Uh, John Wheeler again put it very nicely. He said, how can the existence of space-time, basically, how can physics lead to a violation of itself, of no physics? How could it be that the laws of physics have built in their own demise? Where, you know, as he said, the principle of sufficient causation, the fact that everything has a cause, stops. If time stops, if time ends, then physics as we know ends, because we always use time as a vehicle of our predictions. Now, I want to give you a hint about how, if we bring these two theories together, how we might possibly solve these big, uh, these big questions. So, you know, if, if, if we really have a theory of quantum gravity, then one thing we kind of know almost, you know, without any further details, is that space itself will have to give. You know, space can't be just flat space uh, of curved space. It has to be a quantum mechanical object. So often we think of kind of this kind of, uh, I mean, this image of a fluctuating surface or something. There's a, the, sometimes you use the world of quantum foam. Somehow space itself should be uh, an approximation. So one way to think about it is to uh, think of this image here of Max Planck I picked. If you would zoom in this image, literally on this image on my computer screen, you know, at some point you would see the pixels, right? You would see little pixels. So in the same way, we think that space itself should have little pixels. There's no need to make it infinitely small points. Um, because at some point, quantum fluctuations will kind of wipe out any other further details. So how could it mean that you somehow have a pixelation of space? That's one of the big open questions. And I think actually, by the way, you know, if, if you get anything out of this talk, it's quite fascinating to see that modern physics has given us this hierarchy. So first of all, there is a larger scale in physics, which is the size of our physical universe. And then there is a smaller scale, which is the, 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 the point where, you know, the Planck scale, the, I would say where the pixels of space and time are visible. If you want to get a certain sense of orientation, if you go sit right in the middle, you get roughly the, the, the size of life, the size of a, of, of a cell, human cell, say. Uh, if you go one quarter to the right, you get the basic the size of the, the solar system or the distance from the Earth to the moon. Uh, and if you go one quarter to the left, this is the scale where we are currently in our particle physics search. So it's quite remarkable that from this whole range of different possible physics scales, we already mapped three quarters. The fact that even as a smaller and a larger scale is already a tremendous uh, success and really, I think, you know, a, a very deep, uh, deep fact and very difficult to completely fathom. Now, 
one of the great uh, parts of our phys physics theoretical arsenal is that we have some idea how that very beginning could, could start. Uh, I mean, if in theories of inflation, a small part of space-time has basically is, will, will be ex in a very exaggerated way be magnified on a very large scale. So, if you if you take inflation theories, that would actually be one way to predict, so to say, this kind of quantalistic, you know, baby photo of the early universe. But you can think of it as a magnified version of this quantum uncertainty. To, to use really big words, bringing quantum physics into the classical domain, the theory of gravity, would in some sense answer the question, why is there something instead of nothing? You know, actually, it would fill the universe with these random fluctuations that in the end would have formed all structure uh, through our cosmos. I mean, uh, I think that's extremely appealing. Uh, it's, it's at this moment not at all clear whether it's true, but, you know, if you any see any way what the role of quantum physics is in describing the large structure in the universe would be this. So in some sense, I think it's very poetical that, that you know, cosmic inflation could actually connect literally one end of the scale, the very smallest, to the very large, and actually describe why the universe is as it is. So that might be a way in which quantum physics might address this issue at the beginning of time. What about the end of time? Well, again, here, the, the, the marriage of black holes and quantum physics is extremely interesting. Uh, there's this phenomenon called Hawking radiation, and here's my, the cartoon version of Hawking radiation. So, as you know, uh, and I, I tried to describe, you know, empty space is filled with these kind of fluctuations, particles that come and disappear again. So the cartoon version of Hawking radiation is, is supposed that these particles, this pair of particles, is created just on the edge of the black hole horizon. So one particle is inside and is trapped, it can never escape, and the other particle is left alone outside, it cannot unify again back with its original partner, and so it has to be escaped and become a real particle. If this is a real particle, it has positive mass, positive energy, then this kind of uh, uh, antiparticles would have negative mass and negative energy, and so by falling into the black hole, it would actually decrease the total mass of the black hole. And this is a way in which black holes can evaporate and they can lose mass and they will emit particles. And if you calculate it, at least in Hawking's original calculation, which is an approximate calculation, you can see that black holes can, through quantum mechanics, evaporate again and somehow avoid this technical issue of the end of time. In fact, you can even calculate this, and the famous calculation of Hawking that the, the temperature of this radiation is determined by the surface gravity of the black hole. So, black holes, I would say, are the perfect example to bring these two great theories of physics into collision. Um, often it's said it's the black hole is like the atom of the 21st century. You know, 100 years ago, people were really worried about atoms. They know they existed. They didn't work according to the then current laws of physics. Quantum theory had to be invented to make atoms work. And the same way, I think, black holes provide this terrific paradox. Now, from the point of view of gravity, black holes are literally the simplest thing that you can imagine. It's nothing more than a hole in space-time. But from the quantum perspective, you can think of them as the most complex object. It's the, if you want to make, make the most compact of hard disks, press matter closely together than anything possible, you would create a black hole. And we, have, we can actually calculate, in some sense, the, the complexity that is the information that can be stored into a black hole. So either the most complex or the most simple, de depending on which physical theory you approach these objects, which is like a perfect paradox, because it should be both. Now, how can that uh, solution be resolved? And in just the last five minutes, say a few words about string theory and how basically mathematics is trying to bring all of this together. Now, string theory in very simple form is, you know, you take particles and generalize them uh, to little loops, literally like this, vibrating strings. So instead of drawing the Feynman diagrams of the path that particles take through space and time, you get these kind of rib, you get these little circles that move and they, they build, instead of lines, spaghetti strands or world lines, you get these kind of string worlds, these two-dimensional Riemann surfaces. 
and they have the most they have amazing properties for instance you know they are much the number of these uh, geometries is much simpler than the number of Feynman diagrams essentially at a given order in perturbation theory there's only one diagram to calculate and for instance it's completely geometrical there's nothing that you have to determine in terms of extra rules and if you want to int introduce loop effects or these virtual particles it's very easy because you sum of all possible geometries so there's a very rich theory here and you find that actually these closed strings as I depicted them describe among other things quantum gravity and that's why people started to become interested in string theory particularly in the 1970s and David was absolutely crucial in writing many many papers about this and string theory is at this point the only working theory of quantum gravity that we know but it's also able to capture some of these other ideas about black holes and let me just give a cartoon version again how string theory does this because we discovered uh, 20 years ago that just considering these closed strings is not enough. It's a wonderful theory of gravity, but there are other ingredients that you can add to string theory, in particular things called brains. Brains are kind of surfaces, membranes, that move in space-time, which have the property that you know, the strings can end to it. So this seems a rather arbitrary rule, but it, it works beautifully. So we have these things called open strings, this little line segment that's tethered to this red plane, the brain. And, uh, and why is that fascinating? Because the, the, the closed strings describe geometry, relativity theory. The open strings, in a very natural way, bring gate theories back. In fact, uh, if you think of this as, as uh, in the old days, I would give talks on transparencies, right? And if you had, you had these plastic sheets, and then you could have a bunch of plastic sheets on top of each other say 10 on top of each other. And that's almost how you should think about a brain. It can have many copies on top of each other. And then if you have an open string that is go, goes from one brain to the other, if you take these sheets and move them away a little bit, you, you can see that actually you can have open strings that start in one sheet and end in another one. So you naturally get a matrix of strings. That is to say you should think of these sheets uh, as the colors, for instance, as I had in my, you remember the nice animation of the colored quark. Uh, in that case, there were three colors, so you should think of it in three of these sheets on top of each other, but you can have arbitrary number of sheets. So the remarkable thing is that string theory has the two languages of the small and the large in a natural way baked in. It describes gravity, it describes the curved space that we need for general relativity, and it also describes these kind of matrices, these kind of gauge fields, which are absolutely crucial in understanding the very small. And they also are connected in a very natural way. And one way to illustrate this is how black holes are being described in string theory. It's again very complicated to do this entirely uh, sophisticated with the, all the mathematical equations, but this is the cartoon version. So the cartoon version is you have the closed strings, you know, that gives you some curved space-time, and then you put a black hole inside that curved space. And for the purpose of this talk, you can think of the horizon of the black hole, this area, this no-go area, as the brain. And so you could have open strings that are kind of connected to the horizon of the black hole. So in a very, uh, you know, uh, again, cartoonish way, you can think this is a closed string that's kind of falling into the black hole, and it's half of it is stuck outside the horizon. It's waving help, help, you know. So there, these are these open strings. And, and then I, I think the, the process of Hawking radiation, how the, the degrees of freedom of the black hole can leave the black hole and evaporate uh, is, an, I hope you again enjoy my animation here. So essentially it's this process, two open strings that are moving, they're attached to the black hole, they kind of connect, form a closed string, and then the closed string can drift off. So the remarkable thing is these processes can be calculated in great details. We have many, many calculations uh, describing both the degrees of freedom and the Hawking radiation in great detail, uh, all following the laws of quantum mechanics. And uh, this gives uh, give rise to an incredibly rich uh, theory that's uh, now known as the ADS-CFT correspondence or holography, which essentially says that you know, we, we can use the gate theory 
we can use the quantum mechanical theory to build the space-time and its properties inside the, the, the space-time. And I think that's extremely exciting because, you know, in some sense, the great dream, certainly of people like Einstein, was to, you know, shape a theory of the universe entirely out of the geometry of space and time. So Einstein felt the simplest ingredient was space and time, and he was magically able to describe gravity with it, and his, the rest of his life he tried to build the rest of physics out of space-time. Uh, I think actually that's in some sense wrong. You know, if you think about the beauty of space-time physics, of Einstein theory, it's very similar to the theory of thermodynamics. So, you know, there were two theories that Einstein really loved. One was his own theory of general relativity, the second was thermodynamics. And both of them, I think, in the modern point of view, are not fundamental theories. It, it's not the elementary building blocks of the rest of reality. It's much more an emergent phenomena. So th the modern view has that space-time is not, uh, not something out of which you build things. It's really an emergent phenomena. By looking at quantum mechanics in the right way, you can actually uh, describe, you can describe the behavior of complicated quantum systems, like these kind of quantum black holes, in such a way that space and time and gravity and Einstein's relativity come out of it, which I think is absolutely amazing fact. So um, I think we live in an incredibly rich time where these two big theories are inter intersecting, interacting in a very deep way. And the thing that they have in common are all these terrific mathematical subjects. So, uh, as I said, you know, if you think of the sphere of interest of David and that he worked on, you know, there's all these wonderful topics. And, you know, I, I want to end by something that, you know, perhaps, you know, the, the, one of the greatest contributions that was mentioned before, the Olofman tone duality. Now, uh, duality is a very fascinating concept in quantum mechanics. So you know that in quantum mechanics an electron can behave as a particle and it can behave as a wave and you know if you're a beginning student it's very difficult to get your head around this. So f one of my favorite quotes is actually uh, by Wolfgang Pauli. So Heisenberg discovers the wave particle duality and he writes to his friend Pauli and then Pauli writes back. So this I think two weeks after the discovery of quantum mechanics. And Pauli says, you know, ah, I get it. If I look with my left eye, I see a particle. If I look with my right eye, I see a wave. If I open both particles, I become crazy. <laughs> and in some sense, I think that's in the situation we are now. So we have all these, oops, what happened here? We have all these great subjects in mathematics. Gate theory, string theory, gravity, geometry, Lie algebras, Riemann surfaces. Uh, and we find, actually, there are dictionaries. So it's almost like you have these different languages, and they overlap. And we have dictionaries translating concepts in one area to another. So we have concepts in, 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 in geometry that we can transform into quantum mechanics, or from string theory into gate theory. But we, we are continuously in this situation where we can look with the left eye and we can look with the right eye. If you open the left eye, we see quantum mechanics. If you open the right eye, we see gravity. But it's very difficult for us to open both eyes. And, um, and it's perhaps that's a deep, deep question to how science works. Are we actually able to find something which I would like to call kind of quantum geometry or quantum mathematics that will allow us to do both at the same time. Now, if you study a modern days an electron, you will have abstract quantum theory, you have the Dirac equation, and you're fine. And you know I can pick a basis where I describe it as a particle and a wave. doesn't matter. The mathematical formulation is, is great. It's, 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 it works under all circumstances. But right now, we are in a very different phase. 
We all have these little bits of information. We have dictionaries bringing one point of view to the other. But the thing that we're really lacking is this all-encompassing theory that you know, describes everything. And you know, ideally, it should be the theory describing our universe. So uh, I think there are two, uh, two uh, styles of thought here. Some people might think that we will lay for always have these little domains, and we have smart people who are able to jump from one to another, uh, somehow perhaps slightly open one eye, another eye. I think uh, David was a person like that. Um, but the great challenge ahead is to find a language that's able to capture all of it. And I think actually it should be mathematics. But you should realize that the mathematics that we use these days, the mathematics that you learn, is mathematics that has been evolved in our minds over many centuries and is essentially based on our everyday experiences, how we count, how we do geometry. And our everyday lives are very classical. We're not quantum mechanical objects. So I think at some point what we really need is to develop the mathematical language that is like totally natural to the quantum world. And I think we're not there yet, but we uh, should celebrate the people who uh, tried to bring us uh, away and uh, you know, sh shine a light on all these beautiful developments. David Oliver is one of them. And you know, it's wonderful for me to use his ideas, his theories every day. And I think he will be extremely excited to see uh, the amount of progress that's being made every year and also the great challenges that are ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks, Robert. And let's thank Robert for a wonderful journey from the world of the extremely small to the world of the extremely large and how they could possibly be connected. I think we can throw the floor open for questions now. Please ask questions. Don't feel shy. This works. Clear, it works, yeah. yes. Uh, black holes, uh, they absorb a lot of matter and a lot of energy. Could the evaporation uh, be the dark matter or the dark energy that is missing in our equations or belief of how the universe exists? Um, so... Um, the brief answer is that you know, the, uh, the, the evaporation of black holes goes extremely slowly. And the bigger the black hole, the slower the evaporation goes. So you know, if this would really be visible, like explosions or something, you need miniature black holes. We have no idea whether they exist, but the people look for this radiation. We don't find it. If you ask, you know, in principle, what will come out of a black hole, you know, the great thing of quantum mechanics is that so these, these virtual diagrams that come out, this, out of nothing and disappear again, every physical phenomena that exists will be produced. So whatever the, comes out of a black hole will be the full spectrum of physical particles. So if dark matter is indeed a, a different particle or perhaps a, a number of particles, then the process by which black holes lose their energy will include dark matter particles, but the dark matter as it is. There are theories that uh, have tried to assume that these are kind of miniature black holes, but I think they do not fit any of the experiments. So I, th I think it's, there is no direct connection between dark matter and black holes. Hello. Do I shout? Or yeah, shout, yes. Shout? I'll repeat the question, okay. yes. So the question is a bit double a bit with some say you wrote at some point uh, the usefulness of useless knowledge. Hello, hello. Yeah. Um, and, and the question is, how do I, because all, all what you described today could be thought as this knowledge that in the future will dominate economy, etc., as, as we have many examples in the past. 
how, how do I decide, and that ingredient that you mentioned was beauty, what is beautiful? Uh, and what, how should I look for it? Uh, okay, if you can comment on this. Yes. So th this is a question, I think, I would try to kind of summarize what you're saying, that, you know, okay, so we, we advocate for the freedom of scientists to explore whatever. Um, so what, what are you going to explore? You know, and I think intuition plays an important role, but it's, intuition is not in contrast with knowledge. I would say, you know, intuition is a way in which we deal with very limited knowledge. So we think, you know, both in physics, but in general in science, you know, if you go into the unknown, there are a few facts, a few hints, like in particle physics, we have a few hints that there is something out there, much larger. And then which direction do you explore? And I think often uh, going to the beginning, great scientists have a sense of, have almost a compass, which is often they describe it's the beauty of the ideas. Um, so, you know, it, I find it pretty amazing. Uh, you know, of course, Einstein is a case in point because, you know, what he developed. You know, I think if we would have run history once more, we would generally have general relativity, but we would get it 50 years later, right? Because, you know, there was no need for it in 1915. So it's quite amazing, I think, that in our minds, we have this kind of, some of us have the sense where we should be heading. Um, and uh, it's very interesting to debate, actually, this why we call it beautiful, because often I joke, you know, in, in art, nobody used the word beautiful anymore. It should be interesting or something. So uh, the, the beauty is being chased away out of the arts and it finds a refuge in science, you know, because <laughs> if I say a beautiful equation, we all agree, yeah, it's beautiful, you know, uh, there's no debate about it. So uh, I think there's uh, something quite remarkable in our minds that we see, I would say it's, uh, it's somehow almost, you know, I joke, the beauty of an equation is its impact per symbol. You know, it's a very tiny formula that has a tremendous impact. But I think it's some way uh, for us to, uh, you know, get a sense of what almost the expected outcome is of certain path. Um, you know, there's a, there's a remarkable thing that, you know, the, the internal mathematical consistency and the richness of mathematical ideas has been so incredibly productive in physics. So, um, yeah, I think it's one of the most amazing thing of uh, having a life in science that we have some of our colleagues have this, uh, I would like to say tunnel vision, you know, they can look through the, through the object, through the obstacles and see something that we are heading. But even if we don't see it ourselves, we do feel in some sense that we're going in the right direction, uh, although the path is very uh, complicated. So certainly, I think if you think in theoretical physics, we have this collection of ideas. We know it's all connected. We have no idea what it exactly means, but clearly nature is telling us something. I think mathematics is also telling us something because these, these different subjects seem in a very deep way all to be interconnected. Um, and what the final societal outcomes of this, we'll have to wait. But uh, I think you know, uh, our aim is to understand reality and if you understand the reality in a deeper way, this must have tremendous consequences for our society, um, both in practical aspect, but also you know, in just answering the big questions. I find it remarkable that you know, in theoretical physics, we might have you know, at least beginning of answers of how did it all start, why is the na nature as it is, why is the universe as it is. And uh, so I think the, uh, it's very important that we create the space and the I say the confidence that we can kind of study these and find answers. Okay. So in your uh, graph of the uh, smaller scale to the larger scale, the 75% have been yes. taken care of. Now to cover the remaining 25%, <laughs> there are at least three ways I can see. Yes. One is to take the LHC and push the empty barrier off. The second one is to look at the, the universe and the cosmic microplane. Right. And the third one is obviously the theoretical approach and, and, and development of it. So could you uh, place a bet on which one? <laughs> <laughs> well, the good thing is that, you know, uh, there are always surprises, you know, and uh, in some sense, you know, even no surprise is a surprise. So, so uh, I think actually, um, 
my feeling is that you know, if you think about not only studying the, the, the microwave background, but actually at some point the full evolution of the universe, right? If you can think about like all the data that are, if all the time slices, in, 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 in as much data that's there, that like, so there, there was one huge particle physics experiment, you know, at the Big Bang, and we, we're studying still kind of the, the outcome of that. that. That must be incredible rich. So I think there's a lot to be gained there. But we also have to be aware that we will never study things you know, with the precision as we do in particle physics. So I think we need both. Uh, and particle physics, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's multi-pronged. It's not only the LHC, there are many other uh, experiments going on. Um, and I think it's very nice that you say that somehow mathematical consistency is an important element too, because you know, uh, we're always in this, in this kind of tension that as theorists, we feel that we shouldn't kind of uh, march ahead too far because, you know, and, and perhaps we do. But there are also famous cases of theoretical ideas where, you know, theorists held back. Einstein did not predict the Big Bang. Dirac did not predict the anti, the positron, you know, because it, ah, this is too much, you know. And so sometimes you, a, a theoretical framework can, can help too. And I think actually in some sense, I'm not saying that mathematical consistency is, uh, replaces experiment, but it's a very powerful way to organize your thinking. And, 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 and I would say uh, what we really need is also, uh, I would say, the, what I find extremely exciting in theoretical physics these days is if you, if you think of all these different domains, you know, I could have, this, these are somehow the mathematical ideas. I could, draw a similar picture in theoretical physics, where you have condensed matter, you know, particle physics, homology, et cetera. It's also all being connected now. So the same theoretical ideas are popping up in various fields. You have people in quantum <coughs> information or condensed matter that are still studying emergence of black holes because it's a, it's a very interesting theoretical framework. So I think we should, we should use all three. And, you know, it's extremely exciting that we are, uh, you know, at this time where we see the confluence of all of it. Uh, going through the uh, slide where you had the idea of dark matter as a um, web c connecting the galaxies. Yes. I was Thank you. Uh, bear in mind that, well, with the fact that the universe is expanding, how does this amount of dark matter uh, work if the universe is expanding, if it's just holding the galaxies together? Uh, so, okay, so, so I think in all our cosmological models that we have now, the dark matter is absolutely crucial to, to de describe the structure of the universe, right? So if you basically see how the galaxies are distributed through the cosmos, they are on these kind of strands. They're not just arbitrarily scattered around. So uh, I think actually I mean for cosmologists, the, uh, the, the visible matter, the stars, the galaxies, almost an afterthought. It's really the dark matter that drives the cosmological evolution. And so you know, there are many ways to estimate these cosmological parameters, but actually having consistent cosmology, so a cosmological history over the 14 billion years, absolutely crucial in this. So, uh, and that's highly constrained. So. Um, it's, although there are other ways, direct ways, to measure the dark matter in our by gravitational lensing and others, I think actually these, uh, uh, you know, the, the lot of cold dark matter models are actually absolutely crucial in, in getting the, the current distribution of galaxies right. And in these models, the, the amount of matter is actually fixed, right? So it's not being created. Uh, dark energy is being created because it's, it resides in empty space, and almost by definition, it, it adds to itself. You know, it, it makes space expand, and thereby it creates more dark matter. So the percentage of dark matter, of dark energy, sorry, <laughs> is increasing through uh, cosmological time, and at some point will be almost 100%. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you maybe a potentially silly question, but uh, you mentioned that uh, sometimes the theory, there is a point when you, when you create a theory that you have to choose between 
beauty and truth. Yes. And uh, there was a point where uh, some people at least thought that it would be better to choose beauty. Yes. Uh, <laughs> what do you think that we should be actually be trying to look for? <laughs> well, it's very easy. To be, you, you can argue both cases. So, um, but um, I think, you know, in, in some sense, so, so there's this wonderful phrase, I didn't use it in my slides, but it's often used, you know, what uh, Eugene Wigner called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and natural sciences. So his point of view was, if you have a mathematical idea, say a sine function, a Fourier transform, whatever, you can use it again and again and again. You know, it's often developed for one purpose, but then it, you see it again, it's because it's somehow part of the, literally of the language in which nature speaks. So I think if you have a beautiful mathematical idea, I would say, you know, you have to develop it. Uh, but you might be actually looking at the wrong application. And there are many of these kind of ideas. So string theory is famous, and it was built in the 1960s as a theory of the strong interactions, had all these bad properties, and then certainly, oh, it worked wonderful as a theory of quantum gravity. And we forgot about, and now in some sense, by this ADS-CFT duality, it's back as describing the strong interactions, but you know, in, in a kind of a different space-time dimension. So I'm very happy that we developed the technology. Um, but so I think, you know, if you think about the beauty, it's more about the internal beauty, which in, I think in some sense it's really, a, in the end, you now there is this um, um, idea which I like very much. There's a, a wonderful, I, I mentioned Bill Thurston, the, the mathematician. He wrote a wonderful article. It's essentially about what makes certain parts in mathematics important. And he described a good example. He said, like the derivative. We all know the derivative. He says, how should I think about the derivative? Well, if you go to these high-level math courses, you get something with epsilon and delta. You know, it's very complicated. But you can also think of it as a velocity. And then you immediately know it can be a vector. Or you can think of it as a slope. And you can, oh, it can be a function of two variables, like a mountain slope. Or it can be discrete. Uh, or it can be an approximation, linear approximation. And then he goes on, and then he has somehow definition 37, you know. It's a tangent bundle in some whatever. It's very complicated. And his point of view is that all these different points of view add to the beauty of what is a derivative. That's why we all know calculus. It's wonderful. You can use it everywhere. So I think I would, uh, uh, my theory, my, my advice would be, you know, develop, the, if you see the beauty in a mathematical tool, develop it. But you might actually be applying it in the wrong context. So it might be true, but in, perhaps in a deeper and another way, but uh, I think it's very hard to think of any mathematical idea that didn't have, at some point, uh, physical consequences. In fact, there's a folk theorem among theoretical physicists. The one part of mathematics that you hate, that you avoid always, that's the one at some point you will need. So, <laughs> <laughs> happened to me, yeah. Um, so you alluded that our current understanding of mathematics, which we've developed over the past few years, it's not sufficient to unite relativity with quantum. Yes. So, is, so my question is, do we have any candidates for these new formulations of maths, or is it just, do we know that there needs to be something, but we're completely unaware of how that's going to manifest? I don't know. So we have little toy models. So uh, there are little, because we need something that on the one hand uh, looks like quantum mechanics, and the other hand can describe something like a space. And so there are little toy models, for instance, that I've worked a long uh, time on matrix models, so these are just random matrices. And if you, so on the one hand, they, they feel like quantum mechanics in zero space time, so it's the simplest possible thing. And then uh, if you describe the, the behavior of matrices of the rank, it becomes very large then there are certain geometrical structures that appear. So they're like tiny, tiny baby models that do it. The question is, how do they gener generalize? You know? And you might say, well, okay, a matrix becomes a gauge field. That might be, but that might not be ambitious enough. So I think we are, um, we are really finding our way into a higher level of abstractions. You know, you, it could, sometimes you, uh, also math can be treacherous. I mean, you can have a very rich theory, and then you look at a simple example, and in some sense, you can forget 90% of it, right? So, it, so you, you get such a cartoon version that it's not, 
you're not able to build up the real thing out of it anymore. Um, so I, I, I think honestly we're struggling to find that kind of language. Uh, part of it, as I said, one of the striking thing of quantum theory is, as I said, everything happens at the same time in quantum theory. Right? That's the essential quantum theory that you study the path or all histories, or all quantum processes, or all Feynman diagrams. And we have many of these situations where we think of it as a, you know, we compute diagram by diagram of order by order in perturbation theory, and we have our ways to compute, and then we look at the final answer, and then certainly the final answer is very simple. So something is happening, but we don't know what it is. So I think it's wonderful, because, you know, it could be the other way around, you know. It could be that the whole thing is even a bigger mess, but it's not. So apparently what we are doing, we are slicing the, the final answers in slices. And the slices are complicated, but the whole thing has a much more structure to it. Uh, why I feel optimistic you know, that with the, the right kind of breakthroughs we can do this. Actually, we are a very similar situation than, than certain areas in mathematics. For instance, in mathematics there's a famous thing called the Langlands program. It was created, among others, by Robert Langlands, who's at IES. And it's a big dictionary between, on the one hand, number theory, and the other hand, symmetry groups. And if you ask mathematicians what's the Langlands program, they won't answer it. They give you lots of examples uh, and generalizations. But if you say, what is the big story here? They say, well, okay, somehow you know, these, there are these two different continents, and they're connected, and, you know, and, and there should be some grand theory. But they're struggling to find their ways, and they find new examples, and slowly they build up this big oeuvre, this big catalog of examples. I think actually in quantum mathematics we are in a similar situation. Um, so I'm of, often I'm very enthusiastic to see these baby models, think, okay, that's, that's something that we could look at. And, but there's also something uh, much deeper, because you know, in some sense what we're trying to find is a structure that finds both the geometry, that is relativity theory, and quantum mechanics into it. And the question is, you know, which of these two ideas is the more dominant one? And I would say currently it's often quantum mechanics that's the more dominant one. Uh, so it's quantum mechanical systems that then start to behave and show properties of gravity. Um, my own uh, gut feeling is that in the end we need a little bit more symmetric and something in quantum mechanics also has to give. Uh, like quantum mechanics is not able to deal with any theory where time appears out of nowhere. So, uh, so I think even these toy models, they, they probably are misleading because they're somehow too easy and they, do, they avoid the deep conceptual issues. So one last question. <laughs> We're getting quite philosophical here. <laughs> <laughs> I have what is perhaps a slightly naive question. Um, what's wrong with string theory? Why do we not say, okay, we found a theory of quantum gravity that's it. So sort of what is there left to do? So oh, there are many things wrong with string theory. Um, so th th I think the most important thing is incomplete. That is to say, you know, uh, string theory is very much like this picture. So it's a, a, it's a theory that uh, you would like to describe. You know, if you have uh, a typical physical theory like Newtonian mechanics, you, know, you can ask any possible question. So the string theory, as we know, we know it in certain domains. So we know when do we have a few strings that are scattered. Uh, we know in certain backgrounds, others we do not. Which, first of all, already shows that our formulation is not universal. Um, and, you know, it's, it's in some sense a, a patchwork of certain descriptions under certain circumstances. There's, there's not a grand... For instance, unlike general relativity, where Einstein basically started from the very deep principles that he wanted to have. And want to have the general equivalence principle. Any observer sees the same thing. You know, it's curved space-time. There are a few general principles. Uh, we're still lacking these general principles. So it's, it's like discovering the rules of Feynman diagrams without ever learning about gauge theories and path integrals and all of that. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is that, you know, string theory, and it's a completely different chapter, is that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not one theory. Because you know, if it would describe this four-dimensional world, you have to describe in some sense you know, how some of the extra dimensions string theory are rolled up. So one other lesson that we have learned is that, you know, the, uh, and I would say this is not only for string theory, this is true in general for physics. So physics used to be, oh, you have lots of different models of the world, 
which model is, your, is the real model. What we have found is that in some sense these models are not isolated points uh, in our theory books, but they're all connected. You can take a model and you can push it, and if, if it really is a theory of quantum gravity, you can push it and you can go to the other model. So it's what we call the landscape, so we have this huge space of different models. And the question is not what describes the world. It might be that the whole thing describes the world, but why are we in this particular point in the landscape? Why are we describing this particular uh, solution of string theory? And this comes to, I think, an essential question that we also, if you think about it really deep, is that in physics in general you learn the equations, you learn the laws, and then there are many, many solutions. Think again of like celestial mechanics. You, know, you can have a solar system built out of whatever. Uh, physics is never about why this one solution. It's you give me the situation right now and I predict the future. Uh, in string theory, in, if you really want to understand the universe, it's not only finding the laws, but also finding why these laws have this, what we now experience, as its solution. Which is in some sense not what physics typically does. It just describes all the, the, the equations and then there's a whole catalog of solutions and an experiment will pick out which one. For string theory, the two are connected. So, uh, and you know, this is immediately related to these cosmological issues. Why is the universe as it is? So, that's you know, kind of a chicken and egg uh, issue where we're still you know, very confused about. So, I think these are the two, two real big issues. So, one is find the fundamental laws instead of dice approximations, and then describe why not only the laws, but why a particular solution was picked out. Thank you for your questions. Uh, before we disperse, we'll have uh, Professor Mike Charlton giving us a vote of thanks. I will, I will be brief. It's my job just to say thank you, as Pram said. So first of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming this evening and making this uh, David Olive Distinguished Lecture uh, uh, the event that has been a successful event. Uh, all of you connected with the university will, will know that it's the 100th anniversary next year of the university, and it's also the 100th anniversary of the department. And this is our first named lecture in physics in Swansea. So it's a very, very, very special day for us today. Um, these things don't happen by accident. And I'd like to thank Graham and Prem in particular for organizing this. I'd like to thank Professor Ian Halliday for coming to speak about David. And I'd like to thank the College of Science and the Learned Society of Wales for supporting it. And I'm here today representing the Learned Society of Wales. But finally, I'd like to thank Robert for coming to Swansea. He's honored us by coming here to give this lecture, and it's obvious the fondness to which he, he holds David and the work that he's done. Robert's talk was elegant, enthralling. Uh, it was erudite, and it was educational. And I'd just like to, all of us to thank him very deeply for coming to give this wonderful talk today. Thank you, Robert. Thank you.